Welcome back to the Campbell County Cooperative Extension Lakeside Commons Education Gardens. We're in the vegetable garden today and a few episodes ago we planted our tomatoes, peppers, I think we did some potatoes, okra, uh, watermelon, and life went crazy. We had uh, you know, I had a surgery, we had tons of rain, we didn't have rain, then we got more rain. And it's funny how Mother Nature just kind of takes care of itself. So behind me, you'll see these beautiful, luscious green tomato plants that have gone crazy. And usually I come in here and, you know, you read in the books, uh, you read in ID 128, which I've referred to many of times, the home gardening, uh, vegetable book in Kentucky and it talks about trellising, pruning, uh, you know, getting those suckers off and I uh, haven't done it this year. And I'm going around, I was scouting this morning looking for aphids. The last few years we've been hit hard with aphids, we've been hit hard with um, brown marmorated stink bug and I didn't find one. I didn't find one aphid. and. If you do have aphids, the sign that you'll see is usually they like to get up at the tip top and you'll start to see the foliage cupping in. And you may even see like a, a yellowish color to the foliage. And so again, I usually see it cupping downwards and they tend to hide themselves underneath the foliage. But I am so happy that these I haven't sprayed anything this year. So in the past, when we have uh, the mites, when we have the brown marmorated stink bugs, the Japanese beetles sometimes uh, become a nuisance in the garden too. I'll just use an insecticidal soap. Keep in mind with any soaps and oils that you may use for any type of your management, which is an organic product, uh, you continue on to follow the label on the back but making sure that you apply preferably early morning and you definitely want to avoid any time that it's going to be uh, high humidity because the oils and the soaps actually can burn the foliage and do more harm. So make sure uh, you follow those simple directions. Um, yeah, so I'm going around here looking. Uh, I see wonderful um, flower development, fruit set, uh, as far as fertilizer, I've been getting lots of questions about fertilizer this time of year. Uh, you know, and even questions about why well, I haven't had fruit set yet. Well, very good questions. And, you know, towards mid to late summer, you should be having, getting fruit set. Um, and a lot of times that does contribute to over fertilization with high nitrogen. So keep in mind when you're using a fertilizer, it be a, a, a granular that you would apply to the soil or a foliar that you would spray, uh, mix it in a tank or attach it to your hose, liquid and spray it directly into the foliage, making sure that first number is um, the lowest at this time of year because nitrogen gives it that green lush growth and strength um, of, of the stems and we're not really interested at this time of year of that. It should already have that. This time of year we're really interested in the flower production, fruit set, and disease resistant which that's with the last two numbers um, phosphorus and potassium are good helping with. So you can find something like something with a 0, 5, 5 or a 5, 10, 10 something with a very low nitrogen. And also with fertilization, especially um, with our vegetables, you want to make sure that you're not applying the uh, fertilizer when it's really, really dry. So something I think about is either watch the forecast, making sure it gets a good soaking, and then come out that next morning, and then apply your liquid fertilizer, or you can put down the granular and remember granular needs to be activated by water so you could either water it in with your hose and only focusing on the root zone or you just wait till mother nature provides that so uh and really i'm not gonna i, I did put down a slow release uh, a few, about a month after i uh, put in the transplants and we use a uh, slow release um, organic fish emulsion and so that does have 
some nitrogen value in there, but I haven't applied anything else this year. And, and really, I am just floored of how beautiful these tomatoes look. So um, we talked about a little bit of insect management, and we talked about some fertilization. I want to talk about deer. Uh, we get tons of questions, and I too struggle with deer. And one product that we like to use there's all different types of uh, uh, things that you can do. There's visual deterrent, there's sound deterrent, there's all the caging, there's all different types, but fencing by far is the most effective. And then if you want to incorporate some other deterrent as well. We use um, this Deer Scram product. There are many other products out there. Uh, you uh, Scratch it in around the landscape. You can put this in your vegetable garden. You can put this around your ornamentals. And it is organic product. Just follow the label. If we get a heavy downpour, then that's when you would want to reapply. Um, again, you're not going to put it on the foliage itself, but when the deer come around, uh, rabbits too, we found this to be very effective uh, for rabbits as well. So deer scram, you can find this at most of your nurseries and your box stores, uh, but there are a few other products out there as well. Again, follow the label accordingly. So very good product there. Um, again, can't mention enough, ID 128, this is available online. Call me, I can send it to you in the mail or send it to you electronically. Okay. Another uh, pest that we've been seeing quite a bit because of all of the moisture and the rain that we've been having are slugs. And um, I failed to mention uh, uh, insects have different mouth parts and you can really uh, identify and, and narrow down what pest you have in your landscape by what type of chewing or what type of uh, feeding habits they, they are putting on your, on, on your plants. So mites have a piercing mouth part. So you'll see like little piercings or uh, sometimes little holes, if you will, in your, in your foliage. Whereas snails and slugs, they have chewing. And also you can see their, you know, that residue, that trail mark that they leave behind. So uh, slugs get on our uh, fruit. They'll get on the foliage, ornamentals, hostas is a big one. So they're uh, slug and snail bait. This is really good product. We use this as well. Um, and there are other tricks of the trade, you know, um, using some uh, can that has a little remaining of some uh, sugary substance from a, a beer, and that will actually attract them to their uh, to that can and, instead, and, and, and feed on that instead of um, your foliage. Uh, I'm looking around here. We have a lot, a, uh, so many um, slicing tomatoes getting ready. We have Celebrity here. Uh, it's a very nice one. Uh, we also have, let's see, uh, Sweet, uh, Sugar Sweet 100s, uh, Super Sweet 100s. And I've been looking through here, and I think I ate one earlier. Yeah, here, here we go. So this is a cherry, very nice. Uh, if you want a crop that gives you abundance of, of yield, high yield, start with some cherries or some romas. Um, you're gonna get a little later crop on some of your slicing because they're a little larger, okay? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and eat that if you don't mind. Mm. As I'm looking through here, I'm seeing a disease that comes in the early, early stages of the plant, and it's found on the lower portions, and this is where I typically will come in and prune off, but again, I haven't had time, it's called early blight. So if you saw where I was pruning down here on the lower limbs, um, it's a foliar fungus. It can get on the fruit as well. Uh, so fungi, one of the ways that it spreads is by water splashing. So one way to prevent it from 
uh, splashing around and through the plant is to avoid overhead irrigation. Of course, we can't control Mother Nature, but we want to make sure we're focusing on the root zone. And uh, so that's one way to control these foliar fungi from spreading. Another way is to apply a fungicide. There are many different fungicides in ID 128. There's some other recommendations, uh, but early blight, given the name, starts earlier part of the season. So really this disease is already dormant at this time of year, but there's another disease very similar called late blight that is going on that this time of year, late uh, summer, but these plants are so clean, I would not spray for that. If I start seeing some of these symptoms, which is, you know, the tips, little browning uh, uh, around in the midrib of the, uh, the foliage uh, is turning brown. I see little spots with halos of, of browning or almost purple rings. I would start, I also see some flea beetle damage, which you see uh, these very tiny, tiny holes in there which flea beetles is another insect pest that feeds on all the Solanaceae crops and a few other crops. So that would be peppers, tomatoes, and eggplant. They love eggplant. So if you see these tiny little holes in your eggplant, you got flea beetles and they're very uh, tiny black little beetles and they, you gotta sneak up on them to control them because they will fly away uh, quickly if they feel any vibra vibration. So you can control any of these blights uh, with, uh, there is a powder fungicide, um, and then also liquid fungicide. Now again, make sure you read the label. So um, I, even if I'm applying organic, I like to thin out, get rid of as much of the uh, symptoms um, that I see on the foliage, especially an early blight, just kind of get it out. Uh, thin, thin that canopy out, get rid of the foliage, don't leave it down because it still can splash if it rains. Don't put it in a compost either, get rid of it. Um, another thing too is um, making sure when you're in here, the foliage, or it can't get on the fruit as well. So just be mindful of that. That's too good, I, I can't throw that away. I'll have to eat that later for a snack. So I would um, probably, uh, either cut this off even though there is some fruit on there or I might tie this up there so it's not getting damaged from me walking uh, keep walking around here so I'll put this here but I'll clean it up here shortly so again early blight down here there's also another disease called septoria leaf spot I don't see that on here today but it is very common as well um, yeah so there's really not much more I want to talk about our tomatoes. Uh, beneficial insects, they have been doing their magic. I saw um, some ladybugs um, out in the landscape earlier this morning. So that's probably why I haven't had to spray these is because our beneficial insects, Mother Nature has taken over and has done their job. And I, that's why I haven't had a spray. Well, I want to go over now and let's talk about uh, one of my favorite flower uh, and my favorite, one of my favorite uh, vegetables. So it'll be the okra. So let's move over there and uh, stay tuned. Standing next here uh, to me is this beautiful okra. And okra is actually related to hibiscus. So they have um, the same flower, that beautiful tropical looking flower. This one is yellow. It's not opened all the way. And uh, I just love it. It's one of my favorites. Terry Turner, the hort technician here, she thinks I'm a little crazy for enjoying this beautiful plant. I would put this in uh, even in, in your landscape because it does get fairly tall. It has the beautiful texture of the foliage um, and then the leaf, or excuse me, the flowers, and then of course the beautiful fruit that you can harvest. So I want to share something about okra and the quickness that you have to harvest even quicker than cherry tomatoes. So if you leave it on the vine too long, uh, you'll end up with this. So it's, it's already dried, but don't throw it away. I just take a knife or your pruners, kind of slice it open here. 
and you will find these little black seeds in here and then you can uh, hold these for next year. I would put them in a paper bag, store them somewhere cool and dry, even in your vegetable crisper, in your uh, refrigerator or in your basement. Uh, again, off the floor, but somewhere cool and dry and not using a, uh, a plastic bag, but a paper bag. Something else you can do um, if you get a very large uh, fruit and I don't harvest as often as I should, to be honest, and I usually harvest with my pruners. I do have a harvester knife as well. This one's okay. I would probably use this size um, in a stew, but I'm, I'm pushing it a little bit, seeing the firmness, and it's still, it still has yeah, some firmness here. I, again, I wouldn't eat this just fresh. I would eat this size and this size. These are my favorites, just to kind of clean it off. This is what, we don't spray these. Yeah. Mm. So good. They're better than croutons on a salad, I'm telling you. Mm. And when you harvest this size, uh, they're not as gooey. So a lot of people, they're, they're deterred away from even trying uh, okra. But let's get back to this one here. I'm sorry, I'm kind of jumping ahead because I'm getting a little snacky here this morning. But you can actually then dry this, if they even get longer, dry this, and it makes a really beautiful um, craft. So you can paint them, you can uh, turn them into an ornament. Um, the seeds will dry and they can rattle. So it's really fun to give them to children and let them uh, shake them. But I really like to um, paint them. Uh, you can Google some different images of dried okra art and come up with some good ideas. Uh, but again, this one's probably good for a stew. This one's good for um, eating it fresh. Right now, I dip it in some hummus, uh, chop it up. I remember a few years ago, I did a raw uh, tasting vegetable sampling at the farmer's market here, uh, the market in Fort Thomas, and I just cut it up. I didn't tell people what it was, adults and children. The shape of it is like a star. So that really interested them, especially the kids. Oh, what's that? What's that shape? And I said, well, try it, you know? Um, and they loved it. They loved the crunch, even the adults. And they, what is that? And I said, it's okra, really? So it's fun to put on salads again, kind of mix it in with, um, you know, a, a, a pasta salad as well. Nice, clean crunch, not much flavor, but I just love that crunch. Uh, very good for you. Mm. So delicious. So, mm. not many pests get on this uh, beautiful plant not many disease you might see you know a few little uh, marks here but i just if i see a bad leaf especially on the lower portion i just prune it off and then i'll put that uh, with my early blight foliage and, and discard of it all together while we're here i might as well mention too um, part of my weed management i got a little out of control with purslane which is also an edible weed you can put in a salad, um, but it just kind of went crazy. It has a, that succulent uh, feel to it. Um, a lot of people like to put that in to their salads, but nasturtium, another one of my favorites. And the, the flower is, is just stunning. So you can decorate a beautiful platter of cheeses and meats or a beautiful salad or fruit put a few of these on there but the nasturtium leaves are edible you can put those on uh, some people like to put them on uh, one of my co-workers in Louisville she likes to make her mayonnaise nasturtium sandwich uh, I like to put it on a cracker with either a, a, a cream cheese type or another uh, spreading cheese some hummus oh, and chop it up. It has a peppery taste. So very good. 
it smells good, um, and it's a beautiful flower. It kind of helps control some of these weeds. It's very low growing. Just put it under the okra, and uh, yeah. So you know what? I might even put, just put this in my hair today. It's very tropical looking as well. So yeah, so another good uh, plant to grow in the landscape. Super easy, okra, just water it, harvest it about every two to three days. One plant will be good for a family of two or three. Uh, if you have any questions of how to cook, how to harvest, disease management, you know, that's what Extension's here for. We have tons of information about uh, growing plants and we have even more information about how to cook and prep, um, you know, the, the foods that you cook or that you harvest from your garden. So the next crop I wanna talk about is potatoes. So I need to go get a shovel so we can dig for gold as I call it. And uh, I'll meet you over in the potato area. All right, back in the vegetable garden, and uh, one of my favorite crops to harvest are potatoes. So a few months ago, we were out here, um, got some disease-free uh, potatoes, seeds, and we planted them, we healed them over. I watered, I did put some fertilizer down the same day that I put tomato slow release. And uh, about eight weeks later, here we are. Before we get started, I wanted to point something out. I mentioned earlier uh, flea beetle damage. So here is a great example of what happens. Uh, are some, oh, and there are some live flea beetles on here. Again, they are like the tip of my pinky fingernail, microscopic almost. Um, but I, I know that it's flea beetle because it's the crop. Uh, they like that. And uh, I could see the tiny little holes. There are a few other pest diseases like uh, the, uh, uh, there are uh, worms that get into the um, potatoes. There are the other beetles that get on um, the tomato, striped tomato beetle that gets on them as well. Um, use this very similar product, uh, insecticidal soap. ID128 goes through all of that as well. I did not get around to spraying um, our potatoes this year. That's okay because they still gangbusters. So um, <clears throat> I'll get rid of that. But getting a lot of questions actually um, about well, I planted potatoes, but how do I know when they're ready? So potatoes grow under the ground, and excuse me, and their foliage um, helps us tell when they're ready. So they. Last week, the foliage was cascading over our raised bed here, but it wasn't that lush green color like our tomato plants. They started to discolor, they were turning yellow, they started to shrivel. I know that's not a disease because I just know that that's when, uh, that's what, it's like an indicator. It's telling me, oh, I'm ready to harvest. So that's a good point I want to bring up. So. Before you ever start spraying something, it be an organic product or synthetic, make sure you get that identified because sometimes um, it could just be the plant itself. I'll, uh, I'll tell a quick story. Um, a coworker of mine had someone call. Uh, they just recently cut one of their trees down, wanted someone to come out to help identify what was going on. Well, we asked, well, what type of tree was it? Well, it was a bald cypress, and that client said, well, all the needles just fell down. Oh, no. Well, the needles on a bald cypress, it's a deciduous evergreen, so the needles fall every year. So it was healthy, it was fine, and it was a very mature bald cypress. So, you know, just like their potatoes, they'll start to turn brown, crinkle over. They do kind of look like they're on their deathbed. Uh, there's no need to spray because the plant's ready to harvest. So that's what we're here for is to help you identify what's going on. And it may not be a disease. It's called abiotic, meaning it's no pathogen related. A lot of times it's environmental. So uh, for me, uh, you know, I, you can see all of our vegetables and our cut flowers are in raised beds. Um, I just like to use a shovel. Um, if you're on large acreage, you could, um, you know, get a harvester on the back of a tractor uh, or just get the kids out there. This is one of, 
again, I think it's like digging for gold and it just, it's like never ending. Uh, so I kind of can see where I had my hills by where the, uh, the, where the vines are still growing out. I harvested that site already earlier this week. Um, and you just want to dig. And these are some of our fingerling uh, potatoes. Okay. And look at these beautiful. The, the fingerlings are not going to get any uh, bigger. So this is, this is good mature size here. So all from one, you know, I probably, when we heart, or excuse me, when we planted, probably planted something just as big as that with uh, at least two eyes on there. And look what came from it. But that's not all, there's more in here. So you can get a hand trowel, kinda go around in there too. Oh, I planted some purple potatoes too. These are nice, they're small. Very nice, or they're blue actually. So you can just keep on digging and digging and digging. And it's really nice too, cause it helps uh, you turn over your soil. Here's another purple. It just, it's like they just keep going. So another question I get is, well, how do I store these things? What do I do? Well, very good question. Kind of want to cut the vines off. A lot of people, they'll cut the vines off first. That's what I like to do, cut the vines off first before harvesting. Okay, so you do that, take them off the roots, have your harvest bucket handy. Put them in there. And what you want to look for is, and a lot of people use a spade uh, tool as well to harvest. Um, just be mindful. Sometimes you can puncture, especially your larger potatoes, like the Yukon Golds. You can puncture those. I could puncture this as well. Uh, but any splitting, uh, you want to make sure uh, there's no cracking. Um, there's no green t potatoes. So green just means it's been exposed to some sunlight um, and you don't want those in your mix. So as you're harvesting uh, or maybe when you get back down inside your barn or in the kitchen, sort through your potatoes. And then you want to just keep them in a cool dry. Don't wash. At this point, no washing. You want to let them cure for 10 days or so and then uh, you want to wash off all the soil at that point you want to always keep them in a very dry ventilated area so again similar uh, to some of our other crops you want to make sure that um, the basement uh, that's what I like to do and put them in a, a paper bag a potato sack if you can get any of those um, put those in there and then uh, you never want to wash them until you're ready to eat them, okay? So that's really important because that actually can promote some uh, pathogens and you want to make sure that they completely heal. If there is any type of breaking in that uh, skin, that it heals uh, before you start washing it up. So yeah, and these will last. We harvest them. Uh, they have a shelf life of for a few months. So we'll be, you know, you can make your potato soup uh, for the for the fall and into the winter um, in fact I was even thinking about I got my potatoes I got my okra I have my tomatoes I'm gonna look up a recipe uh, ask Rhonda uh, Rex our FCS agent if there's a good recipe that I could follow from UK that incorporates all three of these and I bet there is um, you know a good stew or stir fry something like that we have wonderful basil out here, some rosemary that I could put on top of that or maybe even chop a little bit of this nasturtium up. So we uh, harvested the rest of our potatoes um, er, last week and we've already given those out. So I left this here to show you all. Let's see, I, I'm kind of curious to see. I can just keep digging. I don't want to bore you with how much is here. Oh, I need to get root down in there. This is going to be a lot. I can feel it. Man. Maybe I shouldn't have shown you guys how I'm struggling. 
Oh, let's see. I see a lot of good worms in here. Oh, what did I get? I didn't get, well, I guess I just got some, up oh, here they are. Yep, more, there's more down in this hole here. So look at these good fingerling uh, potatoes here. Got a label there. Some weeds, pull those out. So yeah, thank you. Now we're gonna um, go over to the watermelon. Uh, one of our favorite watermelons is the yellow watermelon. So very good. We get quite a few questions about how do we know when our watermelon's ready to harvest. So behind me is the watermelon and we'll go over there. Take a look. All right, standing next to the watermelon here, uh, we have a California Sweet and we have Yellow Doll. Both are small to medium sized. Um, we didn't really trellis them correctly. Uh, they, again, they kind of just got away from us, but our tomato cages here have come in handy, uh, not for trellising our tomatoes, but have helped with um, our watermelon. So um, I planted them in this bed over here. I put two seeds um, in each hill and I put four, let's see, I put planted um, two hills in each section. So in this uh, four by 10 bed, I have eight seeds in there and um, quite a, quite a, I guess, mess, if you will, of, of some vines over here. But usually what I recommend is each stem, usually you're going to get quite a bit of flowers, especially on your larger crops. Um, you don't want to overload that vine with the fruit. So especially on a, a small scale, um, a lot of our commercial growers are not going to go out and do this as much or if at all, um, but definitely want good drainage soil and you, you're going to want to make sure that uh, only out of each flower that, you know, that is produced, um, only one to two fruit uh, will set. Sometimes I see a lot of uh, multiple fruit coming out of one flower and it's, it starts some issues and you're not going to get a good watermelon. So you may even have to pinch off some of those little baby fruit. I know you're sacrificing, but remember that energy is just going to go into those other um, other fruit that's already started and give all the energy to that. So we were a little late on seeding our watermelon, but this is our, this looks like to be our yellow doll. Um, let me, yeah, I can tell a little bit between because the yellow doll and the California sweet have a little bit different foliage um, pattern to them. Uh, very in, uh, lobed indents of the foliage on the yellow doll and not so much on the California sweet. So this is, here's a yellow doll here and it got smushed in between. Uh, got smushed a little bit I might be able to wiggle it through but the telltale sign here I call it the umbilical cord of the watermelon it's going to start browning and kind of where the that stem is attached to the watermelon not only is the the stem going to start turning brown but kind of the belly button part of the watermelon up at the top there it's gonna have a halo of brown as well. Again, that's kind of an indicator of, okay, the turkey's done, the watermelon's done. So you wanna keep an eye on that. Um, this will probably be ready now, I bet, in probably a, a week and a half or so, and we'll be able to harvest that. Um, trellising in an urban setting is really fun. Um, you can use some of these cages. I've seen people actually use old pantyhose to kind of hammock there their little pride and joy of their watermelon. We have a few over here laying around in the ground. Um, we might put some cardboard down because we this stays really wet down over here and I don't want where it's laying down, I don't want it to start rotting or insects start getting on it. So I may put some cardboard down. But um, 
We haven't sprayed these either. The same day I put the slow release on the um, okra and uh, tomatoes and potatoes. I also put that same slow release on the watermelon shortly after we planted uh, and that's all I've done. So on a larger scale, yes, you would want to come back and fertilize. Um, they can easily start um, getting powdery mildew if you see that, just like our squash and zucchini, so keep track of that. But I don't even see any of that on ours either. We kind of keep the, the vegetable garden on the drier side, um, but it's all looking good. Uh, we probably have about six or so good size watermelon that I could see right now. So we'll be enjoying that. We have a yellow and we have a red. Now, if you've never tried a yellow, please, please, please uh, try it. It is so sweet. I know that there's a few farmers over that sell at the uh, Fort Thomas Farmers Market, which, are, which is on Wednesdays at Tower Park. Lobenstein and Scott's Farm. I know for a fact that they both grow the yellow watermelon and uh, they'll be having that. Uh, usually they have it late July, August until they're sold out. So get there early because I like to buy two or three of them. So well happy gardening and uh, we'll be back next time and uh, enjoy the weather. Enjoy all the fruits and vegetables that you're harvesting and uh, happy gardening.